Well, welcome to the Truth About Estate Planning discussion. We're so glad that you've joined us. I'm Paul Grant, and uh, these, this is Richard, Danielle. We are the three attorneys here at Planning with Purpose. So a little bit about me briefly. Um, went to law school in Lansing, Michigan, and at Thomas M. Cooley Law School. I actually went back to school later in life when I was 34, went back and got my bachelor's, then on to law school when I was 36. Actually, those numbers are wrong, aren't they? They're actually 36, then 38. Let me get my story, my own story right. And um, so I've been practicing law for about 14, 15 years now and uh, started the firm about 10 years ago. So there's a little bit about me in a nutshell. My name is Danielle and um, I grew up over in Eastern Washington. I went to Gonzaga for undergrad where I majored in economics and then moved over to this side of the state when I went to law school at University of Washington. Um, so I've been with the firm for uh, four years now actually. So just past my four year anniversary. My name is Richard Glinsky. I'm also an attorney here at the firm. I graduated from University of Washington, majored in psychology because I thought it was fun and I knew I wasn't going to do law school, so I figured why not. And it was fun. It was a good thing to learn. Um, then I stayed at University of Washington for, to finish my law school time degree and shortly after got connected with Paul Grant and it's going to be my third year here very soon, so we're coming up on my two year anniversary with the firm and it's been a good run. It's been a good time. It is. Well, we're going to discuss today some things about estate planning. And really the premise of today's discussion is that unfortunately, most estate plans just simply don't work. So what do we mean by most estate plans don't work? Well, statistically at least, the average person in America reviews and updates their estate plan every 20 years. Now, I don't know about you guys or you, but my life definitely looked a lot different 20 years ago than it does today. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So what are some other reasons why most estate plans don't work? The law and the taxes are constantly changing as well. Um, I, I'm sure that you've all heard about different things in the news and everything else. And so in those 20 years Richard was just talking about, there's constant changes that are happening in our world as attorneys. You know, um, as a parent I can speak that uh, even just five years ago when my girls were coming out of high school compared to now they're in their mid-twenties, I looked at my girls a little bit differently. Some of their maturity, some of their life uh, events that have taken place, how they begin to demonstrate managing money. And I know that may, many of you may have had family issues such as maybe you've had a child go through a divorce, maybe you've had uh, children or grandchildren that have special needs or other life events just keep moving. So all of those things may shift how I view the world and how I view things in respect to my estate planning. So we're going to uncover a few other things but for a large part what happens is that most estate plans don't work because we do a one and done document instead of having a relationship where things can uh, continually be updated. So let's talk about what we what do we mean when we talk about estate planning? Yeah, what does estate planning even mean? What's possible with estate planning? Well, in order to figure out what we can do with an estate plan, we have to first define it and lay the groundwork for our work. So the definition of estate planning is multifaceted, meaning that there's a lot to it. So first and most importantly is you want to make sure that you're able to control your property while you are alive and well. Now, now I don't like control. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but is control a big deal to clients? Yeah. Absolutely. Big deal. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so when we talk about control, why is that part of the definition? Well, we want to make sure that you have control and that you're able to do anything that you can now with your property after you've created an estate plan. So we don't want to take anything from you. As well as update your estate plan because you should be in control of your estate plan. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the definition is I want to make sure that I plan for me and my loved ones if I become disabled. That sounds like a really simple definition, but in the hundreds and hundreds of estate plans that we've reviewed, um, I have maybe found one plan and 
this is unfortunately very true, that may have actually discussed what happens for my family's sake if I became disabled. So most plans will accommodate your needs, but very few plans talk about other people that for may sure. rely upon you, whether it's financially, emotionally, or relationally. And what we mean by disability is simply it's a very broad definition. You simply need help managing your finances for one reason or another. It could be a permanent issue, could be temporary, could be a physical problem, could be a mental issue. And then finally, uh, we want to get what you have to who you want, when you want, and the way you want to. So this is kind of what people think of when they come to us is that these are death documents. But actually, we want to take care of you during your lifetime and then talk about after you've passed away. Now, you'll see here that there is a big theme of control even here. You want to be able to control what happens even after you're gone. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean controlling and puppeteering from the grave. What it means is that the estate plan that you created has a very predictable and known outcome. In other words, what you said should happen, that's what happens at the end of the day. So what we find is that we have three stages of estate planning. And those three stages are that, number one, we need to make sure that we plan for you when you're alive and well, and so that you can remain in control. Number two is that we plan for disability, so that if you lose control, you remain in control. And finally, the stage is that we want to make sure that we have solid planning for when it's your turn to leave this earth, that there is a strong plan left behind. So we've sat across the table from uh, hundreds of different people and everybody has said that ease of transition is paramount to what some of their goals Absolutely. are. Absolutely. They don't want their beneficiaries looking like this when after something tragic has happened. Um, so that is the main goal of most people who come to us, is making sure we have a smooth transition. And the way that we can do that is that we create a plan that's going to work to how you would see that transition happening. And we're not going to guess and hope that that's the transition, but we want to know that that's exactly what's going to happen. So what is our goal? What is your goal for estate planning? Well, first and foremost, estate planning is not about the document. It's not about whether you choose to use a will or a trust. It's actually all about you. It's about what you want out of your estate plan. What are your goals? Uh, who's your family? So it's very important to look at everything very holistically and broadly. And finally, who are the people that you love and how do we protect and integrate all of that into your estate plan? So our ultimate goal is to create a plan that meets your expectations with a very predictable and known outcome so that at the end of the day, the estate plan that you create, that's what happens. That leads us into the estate planning pyramid. Most of the time with traditional estate planners, they start with a pre-designed template of a document that is typically tax specific or it has been designed to make sure that there's a tax component. But let's look at where, where pyramid should really be. We believe in starting with the client themselves. That's right. What are your goals? What do you want to accomplish? What's your picture? Well, once we understand that, then we need to understand who the players are, which Richard already said. We need to understand your family. Most individuals would much rather ensure that their family unit remains together than make sure that they save a tax issue or make sure that the money is somehow divided right. If money created separation in the family, we probably have failed as your attorneys. Then we can talk about your wealth. After we understand your family, we can talk about your wealth, how to expand your wealth. And believe it or not, taxes and the law are the last thing that we actually talk about. Yeah, we actually treat it like a jigsaw, the piece of a jigsaw puzzle. You guys know the answer, but <laughs> what is the easiest part of a jigsaw puzzle to complete? Well, most people that we talk about say... Corners or corners. the edges. The edges, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but well, our proposition is that it's actually that last piece. And that's because there's only one way that it fits. There's only one way for it to fit into the big picture, and that's how we treat the law and taxes. After we've created the base plan, after we've protected the family, have really structured it, there's really only one way that the taxes and the law are going to fit So together. we should know the taxes and the law. That's our job. So we should be able to fit it around 
your plan instead of forcing you and your family into a pre-designed legal and tax plan we want to do the opposite know you know your family take the law and make it work on your behalf instead of reverse that's right so now that we've talked about some goals and what is estate planning generally let's now get technical and talk about some of the tools that we use as estate planners so these are some of the common ways that you can do estate planning there's really only one wrong way on this list which is doing nothing and you're here and you're watching this so you're not in that boat so thank you um, unfortunately that's the most common way that is the most to do common. estate planning right mm -hmm. yeah over 50 percent of americans do not have an estate plan less than a third of americans have some type of a of medical directives and um and end of life directives so we need to correct that that first one is the worst thing that you can do so if you're there it's okay we're glad that you're making this connection but let's move past uh, the nothing into something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another common one is a will. That's what most people think when they think estate planning. That's what most of our clients come in and they say. They say, I need a will. Well, let's talk about it. That maybe, might be true. Maybe that's might true. true. But maybe there are better options and that's okay. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's joint ownership. So there, uh, if you have a joint bank account, for example, that's actually a form of estate planning. So um, also giving assets away, not to be generous, but for specific estate planning purposes. Beneficiary transfer, so if you have a retirement account, for example, and you've named beneficiaries, again, you've done some estate planning. And then there's a revocable living trust, which we'll talk about as well. So we believe that every person needs four major documents, a will or a trust, then a financial power of attorney to make sure that the finances are taken care of should something happen to you. And then a medical power of attorney. In Washington State, we actually have two documents that work together. There's a health care power of attorney and a mental health care power of attorney. And then there's a living will or the end of life document, also known as a durable power of attorney. And then there could be a whole lot of other documents that apply depending on the circumstance everyone should have a HIPAA authorization, so that's access to medical records for your, men, for your healthcare powers of attorney, healthcare instructions for the healthcare powers of attorney, and then some of you may have minor kids, so minor child instructions as well as a guardianship power of attorney will be very important for you, and then amongst other things, final arrangements and things like that. Well, let's move into if we use a will, then um, really that's one of the most uh, standard documents that people are very accustomed to and a will does a couple things very well so number one it'll tell us who your beneficiaries are it'll ensure that uh, that what you have left over that goes through the will process or through the probate process will actually get to the right people number two it names a personal representative um, th that's the term in Washington but others may be familiar with the name executor so in other words who closes the estate who has the legal authority should you die to sign your property over to the beneficiaries. Then the third thing it uh, will does well is it gives instructions to the court. Primarily in Washington we say, court, we don't want you in our business unless we really need you. Now there might be a fourth issue, which was um, Richard mentioned some, some documents that need, but guardians need to be named in a will. So if you have minor children, a will is always um, needed for that fourth component. Now, Paul, you're talking about wills, but the slide here is talking about probates. Is there a reason that we're doing that? Yeah, wills a, go through probate? Well, I don't know. What, what, you do our settlements I do. around here. I do what our do you think? <laughs> so anything that is in your personal name, so even if you're using a will, um, anything that's in your personal name that doesn't have a joint owner and is not does not have a beneficiary designation has to go through something called probate. And probate is a court-driven system where we bring your will and it tells us, gives us instructions of who's going to close your estate. But it's a court-driven process that essentially makes sure that you owned the property when you passed away and that there's no debts or other people who are trying to come in and take that property. So when your beneficiaries get it, it's free and clear um, from the title. So that's what it's doing. Um, 
but you may or may not have some, some experience with probate, and some of the complaints is that, number one, it's too expensive. So it's a, um, it's someplace between two and three percent of what goes through probate on average in Washington. That that's what your estate will be charged to close the estate. It also it takes a long time. So I know what I'm doing, and I couldn't close a probate faster than six months because there are certain statutes and notifications that I have to give in order to close that probate properly. So that's a really simple, straightforward probate is six months but it could go anywhere from a year to 18 months or even two years depending on how um, complicated the probate is. And then the last one is that it's a fully public process. So I have to go in and I file everything with the court and someone could go in and, and request those court documents. So there's a lot of personal information that actually goes into those court documents and so um, that's fully accessible to the public now. Now there is a way that we can design a plan to make sure that you avoid probate and uh, but yeah use a will system so it typically is in combination with joint beneficiary status also um, with beneficiary designations and currently in Washington State or actually recently is a better word we started in Washington a beneficiary deed so actually your house that was the one thing that we could not avoid the probate process with we can now but here's the other concern with probate or a couple other thoughts is that number one um, a will acts like a check writing system so in other words a, a true simple will simply gives money to someone very similar to a beneficiary designation. So if you had like an IRA or if you have a bank account and you put a beneficiary, that is a contract that you have with the bank or with the financial institution that holds your retirement account. So that if you die, that contract hasn't, has not been um, eroded, it hasn't ended. Rather, the bank or the financial institution has a legal requirement to follow the instructions which are get it to the people I've named. That's how a will also operates. It ends up being an instrument that says get it to the right people and it doesn't matter whether they're young or old, whether they're impoverished or rich, whether they already have tax problems or don't have tax issues. It doesn't matter if they're special needs or whether they're, they're um, an addict or whether they're a very responsible person. All it's going to do in the simplicity of its form is make sure that the right people get the money. And so that is a benefit. We're getting it to the right people, but are we getting it in the right way? Because that was a part of our estate planning definition is getting it to the right people but in the right way that could benefit them. So wills don't have any tax planning involved in it as well. That's one of the bigger considerations as, uh, uh, also with a will. So most wills will end up taking us at one time or another through a probate system and that could delay the timing by which your beneficiaries are able to receive the, fu the, the money and then it also is, I hope my beneficiaries are at the right place at the right time, not going through divorces or have creditors, or going through bankruptcies or anything else. Life gets in the way sometimes, so we're hoping that when we get them the money, that they'll use it wisely. So is there, all, is there an alternative? Because so far it's seeming like a will could get the job done. Oh, that's it. Might so as well shut many, down the camera. So many unpredictables of life that, well, is there an estate plan that could work around that and be ready for those types of curveballs that might be throw at us. Well, set my own stage there. Enter the revocable living trust. Now, you may be wondering, what is a trust? I've heard about them. I've maybe seen them somewhere on the internet, seen them on YouTube. What is it? Because I've heard that they can do a lot of different things. Well, they can. So, all that a trust really is is this candy bowl right here. Now, I it's like not, candy. It's not literally a candy bowl, but all a trust is, is it's a holding container. It's a holding container that holds stuff. And now this stuff happens to be candy here, but really it's your assets. It's your bank accounts. It's your investment accounts. It's your property. So your primary residence, any rental properties you may have, that's what we mean by your stuff. And 
your trust would hold at. So, um, so during our discussion with clients, we're asking very specific strategic questions. When we get those answers back, that's us building the bowl itself. That's the trust. So then we start, for like marrieds, mm -hmm. we put both hands underneath, correct? Yep. And so that means we've got two hands. And now whoever holds the bowl manages and controls the trust itself. Okay? And so when I was talking earlier about how probate works, so everything is in currently your personal name. So let's but, use like the house. So yep. th this is your, your home. So if this was my home, this would be in the name of Danielle Olero. And when we create this holding container, now we're going to put everything into the name of my trust. So for my house, it would now go into the Danielle Olero Trust. Now all of the instructions that we've walked through now attach to whatever is inside of this trust. We put the hands underneath, so a married couple would be two, um, or a single would be one person, and it's still all running under your social security number. So it's still all your stuff. I can reach in, I can use anything that's in here just the same way as I could before it was in my trust. But now all of these instructions have attached. Now, during your lifetime, uh, as long as you're competent, can you change your trust? Mm -hmm. So we, you can change your trust at any point in time. I could have, I have so much control. I could take out my house, say I want to put it back in my personal name. I, want, I don't want anything to do with this trust anymore. So I have complete and absolute control uh, during my lifetime while I'm competent. But we don't want to do that. We want to keep it in the trust. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so in other words, by having this trust, and by this trust we mean revocable living yeah. trust, Keyword revocable means you can revoke it at any time you want. So this plan is only permanent if you want it to be permanent. And so what happens is your life literally does not change in any way, shape, or form. You still file your taxes as you normally do. You really, the person whose hands are under this, the trustee, if you will, has full and absolute control. Now, Richard, what happens if uh, if you and your wife are holding the same bowl? Right. And, um, and now you start going a little bit funny on us. Well... I would hope that my friends and family would catch that. <laughs> so what happens is now my hand would leave right. and my wife's hand stays here. So now my wife. So she still has control. She over still has 100% control. Okay. And, but are there instructions of how to care for you? Because wouldn't that be a, an important part of the trust? Definitely, right? Because remember that second definition of estate planning that we gave is we want to create a plan for what happens if something happens during our lifetime and we're still alive but we need help managing our finances we mean disability what happens if i'm disabled well the trust is very different from a will okay so a will it's a court governed document so there's only so much things so many things that we can change a trust is a private contract so we can customize it really the way that you need it to be customized to your particular circumstance. And so, yes, we are able to include instructions for what happens if you experience a disability. So now imagine that both you and your wife are disabled and you named me as your trustee, okay? So now the bowl is gonna come over to me and now because I manage it, and now it's not my stuff, it's your stuff, correct. correct? But there are specific instructions in a trust that now I have to follow. So number one, I get specific instructions. A power of attorney, what does that do? It lets you do what you think is best. Okay, so in other words, a, a power of attorney is a document that says if I have a bank account, and we use a will, it gives access to that account, but really doesn't give clear instructions to the user. So therefore, a trust gives very specific instructions. That's really good because now I feel confident in knowing what Richard and his wife want me to do with their money so that I can then uh, really fulfill my duty to them. Number two is that if they had people behind them who are going, Paul, you're doing it wrong. Well, then I can go, well, no, look, the instructions are right here. I'm following the instructions. Now the trust has actually protected me when I'm doing well. So during disability, it, it's really an important document to ensure that your finances keep moving in the way that you have designed. 
And returning to that same storyline, what if Richard and his wife were taking care of his parents? Could you, as the trustee, also take care of them? Yeah, well, that, that, if with the power of attorney, the answer would be no. But in a trust, as long as the instructions were in there, because we would ask that question in our firm, mm -hmm. who else uh, relies upon you financially? Who else do you want to take care of? All of a sudden, that instruction is here, so now I have the authority from Richard to go ahead and use his money, as long as it doesn't financially harm him, for the continued support of his parents. And so we can, uh, minor children would be, right? And so sure. if we have minor children, we want them to be well taken care of. So a trust is a really important document that protects you, your intent, but not only that, it really does protect the person that you're gonna lean upon to say, if I need help, then you're, you're stuck with this thing, but let me help you should I put you in that position. That's very, very different than when we use a will and a power of attorney. So that accomplishes our initial uh, definition, which is that you have complete power and control while you're alive and well. We're going to take care of you and any of your loved ones through this trust. And now, if you remember, the last part of our definition is what happens after you've passed away. So using a trust, um, now the beneficiary, so if I'm Paul's beneficiary, Yay for of me. course. <laughs> then um, I would inherit a trust just like this. So in, as opposed to a will, which is a check writing instrument, everything comes here. Now I'm going to get a bucket just like this. So one. I'm going to set up a sad story for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. So if we used a will, and a will is a check writing instrument, or we used a beneficiary designation, now the candy, your assets, are going to go directly to your hand. Oh, but Danielle, I'm so sorry. The, the, the relationship in, in, in your future, uh, he goes, yeah, no, I don't like Danielle. Impossible, by the way. Um, and so I'm going to leave you. And now I'm going to want to actually take a little bit of this because it's in your hands. Oh, sorry about that. But then you have a bad day and you rear end Richard, uh -oh. and Richard, what are you going to do? Really well, you're going to try to get some money out of it. And so thing. you're probably so going to reach gonna over sue her and, and say, by the way, I think I'm going to take a uh, piece of this because uh, sad. you hurt me and you owe it to me. Yeah. So now, I'm let's change the story to where if you have a trust, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Now this young man who just doesn't know what he's doing decides to leave you. Okay. Now, 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 now we have something very different. Yes, I'm gonna go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say that, so now, if that young man decides to leave, um, what Paul's left me can't be taken. I rear end Richard, he also can't take what, I, what Paul has left me. Um, so now a bubble of protection goes around what Paul has left me as his beneficiary, and any outside forces actually can't come in and take what he's left for me. So this really becomes one of the strongest shields known in law. It's the trust share. So when you have a trust during your lifetime, you are able to change it, amend it, do whatever you would like with it. But at that point in time... Uh, my apology. Richard, during your lifetime, do you get that same shield? That's exactly where I was going. Oh, Thank okay, you great. Sorry me. about that. So during my lifetime, this is my trust, and I can change it, take things out, put things in however I want. Because of that, this is not an asset protection plan for me. The thought process there is, look, if I'm able to control my stuff, that means my creditors can come after it. And that's just the way the cookie crumbles. However, the story changes dramatically after I pass away and I leave this trust to my beneficiaries. At that point in time, there is a shield that comes over it and it no longer is a revocable trust. It becomes an irrevocable trust, meaning that nobody can change it, nobody can access it other than the person that I said can access it. So if I said that my kids can access this, that's the only person who can touch it. None of their creditors, no walking away spouse, nobody. So if we put up the, 
the slide, there we go. The, um, these are the things, again, just as, a, um, a, as an example of things that we can protect beneficiaries from. The, the SNT is a special needs trust, and so we don't need to disinherit special needs children. We can actually set up a trust that is protected from governmental intrusion. Um, if a surviving spouse gets remarried, it would be nice if we could protect the, the intent of the first spouse to pass away. So there's many things with a trust that give us great control and the ability to protect from uh, when someone passes away. It's a phenomenal family legacy that we leave behind. Sure. Well, how do we do this then? So, um, so we, how are we different than your average individuals out in the marketplace? Well, the typical individual in the marketplace is going to create documents for you, they're going to give them to you, and they're going to see, well, see you later, let me know if anything changes in your life and you decide you want to change your plan. Well, how do you know that something's changed to the point that you need to update your estate plan? Yeah, and, and in our experience, um, Danielle, how many times have you had a client, when we ask this question, say, oh yeah, the attorney that created my first will or my first trust, Oh, they just contacted me last year. So yeah, pretty much never. Yeah, never That's yeah. <laughs> pretty much never happens. Yes, we're, so, no, we're notorious for giving documents and then walking away. Yeah, and that's what Richard said at the beginning, which is on average people update their estate plan 20 years. And so we've talked about how we can accomplish all of your goals through using these different tools, but unless we stay in relationship, then we can give you the best document on the planet, but that plan is soon going to falter because you are going to go through changes. Your family is going to go through changes. Those legal and tax changes always keep moving. And so that informal updating system of just come back when you need us really, in our experience, doesn't work. Yeah. So what we've created in our system is a formal updating system. So we have filled this gap in the marketplace and have invited our clients to take us up on it and remain engaged yeah. and let us know if something changes from year to year and let us update them and let them know if there's a new legal change that really affects their estate plan because they're not attorneys. Nobody thinks about this other than estate planning attorneys. Yes, yeah, we're weird. <laughs> so uh, what we've developed then is the estate planning life cycle. And this is the kind of the process or how we see uh, every estate plan, whether, whether it's, uh, it's known or not, this really is what we have found. Number one is that we need to in, uh, educate. Hopefully that's a little bit of what we've done. After you've watched this, we're going to give you an opportunity to sit down with us and actually sit down, talk about you specifically. Then we need to engage and actually create. So we need you to move forward. Then we move into financial integration. If your assets are not integrated into your plan, whether it's a will or a trust, then your plan fails. You can have a great will. As a matter of fact, there's a thing called a testamentary trust, which is where you use a will. Most of them fail. Number one, it's an antiquated document. Number two, the assets are not integrated into the plan. It doesn't matter what you use. Your assets must reflect the, the estate plan as a whole. Then we move into the continuation program. We'll get into that in just a second. So that's a long -going, an ongoing relationship with the estate. How about your family? Is your family ready? Are they educated to receive wealth that they didn't know that, they, that was coming to them? Have they been financially trained? Are they ready to assist you if indeed you had a health issue? We want to train your family to make sure that they are ready. And we know these life adjustments are coming. Yep. Do we not? So we know that every day I've gotten older. They have not yet, but I have. And so therefore, I know that life adjustments are coming. Both my parents are alive. I'm watching it in front of my eyes. That life continues to happen. Then, after life adjustments, the part that we don't like is that because we get attached to clients is that people end up passing away. And a smooth transition, I was all the way back at the beginning of our discussion, having a process and a settlement system in place ready for your family that's been trained and educated creates a smooth transition and this truly we believe sets up um, legacy for your family and for your legacy to be understood to be known and to be followed that 
in our belief, is a very powerful opportunity. So we have a three-step strategy, um, which is that we want to educate and engage during your lifetime. Um, and then we want to commit your fam you and your family to um, continuing to update and to educate. And then really have that secured system, as Paul was saying, um, after you've passed away to make sure that there is that smooth transition. So we call this formal relationship program our legacy and maintenance program. It's really an opportunity, as we've reiterated, to stay and remain engaged and be able to update your plan whenever life happens. So on a practical level, what happens with the legacy maintenance program is at the beginning of each year, all of our clients receive two documents from us. They receive an asset review, and an asset review contains all of your assets, your banks, your investment accounts, your properties, and you have an opportunity to let us know if anything in your life has changed. Have you opened up any new accounts? Have you closed any accounts? Have you consolidated at all? Have you purchased any new properties? We want to know about it because we want to help you make sure that your life remains integrated with your estate plan, that they reflect one another perfectly. In addition, we're also watching over our clients' tax issues, and so if there is an estate tax that you are already in or that you are getting close to, updating everything allows us to really watch over you and make sure that indeed we can see things coming down the road before they happen. Lastly is that whether you needed um, disability assistance or whether you passed away, when we know where assets are, it is as, it's very smooth for the family to then come alongside and make sure that um, that information is given to them. Asset understanding is very important and the relation in, in the ongoing relationship, it's a critical component. And then the second document that you'll receive um, from us is an estate planning review worksheet. And that is um, like a 15 page document where we say these are all of the people that you've appointed as helpers in your plan and you've given them a specific role. So are they in the right role for you still as your life has changed? And um, have you had any other grandchildren or are there anyone else that you need to plan for? So every year, in case you haven't looked at it, um, you have the opportunity to take a chance and look at it, make sure that everyone is where you want them to be. And because we've been on top of where your assets are and what does your financial life look at look like at the end of the day when you pass away we can promise you that your estate will not go through probate that's because every year you've let us know what assets have changed where are your finances at so that we're able to assist with making sure everything is financially integrated with your estate plan because of that if you have a trust your assets are no longer in your own name, but they're in the name of the trust. So remember what probate was for? Probate is for people who die and they have property in their own name. The trust never dies. So the trust does not need to go through probate. And also in the Legacy and Maintenance Program, we want to educate your family. So we have annual education events. Talk about what happens when someone does die. It's our belief system that if we can educate the, 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 the role players that you're going to name as who's going to close your estate, um, then and give them the proper information before the event happens. See, when someone passes away, I know, no one is ever emotionally touched. They think perfectly clear. No, it's exactly the opposite. It's, it, it's not an enjoyable time. As a matter of fact, it's the worst time to learn. So therefore, we want to educate in advance. What is the process? Get that core education in them before an event happens. Likewise, we do disability trainings. Um, and so we want to make sure that if someone needs assistance, if a client needs assistance, the family knows what to do, where the assets are, and how they are supposed to help them. Education is very important. And, um, and also, um, you get the benefit of our continued legal advancement. We have new ideas sometimes, and we would like to make sure that they're integrated into the legal documents. So we actually reprint everything that we do every three years. And you get the benefit of that by remaining in relationship with us as well. 
fixed pricing. So we guarantee that if you pay us on time and come to one annual meeting a year, we won't raise your fee. So you could have a lifetime set fee for the annual engagement as well. And then we have a guaranteed fixed closing cost. So that's the relationship program in a nutshell. And it's my belief, my understanding is that we are really one of the only attorneys in the Pacific Northwest that has a solid um, ongoing legacy and maintenance program. Why others don't, we can't answer that question, even though we've been searching. But what we have found is clients appreciate relationship. They want the stability of ensuring that their documents are ready at any time, um, that their family is educated, that their assets are integrated, and that their plan has not fallen legally or within the family structure. Look, estate planning is easy, right? Oh, yeah. just, just let me know 30 minutes. 30 days before you die. 30 days is better than 30 Yeah, 30 minutes, we can't too much. Even 30 days is gonna to be tough. Yep. But because we don't know that date, because, and I'm glad I don't, we can't get your plan done. So having a relationship component is really the answer for estate planning. Well, that reviews what we've talked about. Yep. Yep. The estate planning life cycle really is the lifeblood of what we do it encapsulates everything perfectly. So the first stage again is to create the estate plan and make sure we design it around your family specifically, around your particular circumstance and situation. And then we invite you to take us up on the real formal relationship, the legacy maintenance program so that we can remain engaged and help assist you and the family as time goes on. Yeah, so thanks for watching this. And so as Richard was saying, um, we would invite you to actually call our office and we have a complimentary opportunity for you because you've watched this video to um, sit down with one of us and so that we can talk about you and your personal goals and your family to find out what tools we would be able to use to accomplish those goals for your estate plan. And even if it's just a review, then we'd like to give you the assurance that indeed your current estate plan is at a level that is going to work for your, for your goals and for your purposes and to make sure that your family is properly protected. So we never take a client that um, with a preconceived idea. There's only two tools that any estate planner can use. It doesn't matter where you go. It's a will or it's a trust. What you need, we don't know. But we hopefully provided you with some reasonable um, explanation of the, what a will can do. It can do some, some very good things. And what a trust can do. We believe that it can do a little bit more. But what is right for you, what is right for your family, come on in. Let us help you. So that's it. That's it from us. We hope to meet you soon. Thank you. Please give us a call. Um, there, there again is our information on the screen. And thanks for taking your time to watch our, our uh, video. Thank you. Thank you.